Hello. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to everybody tuning in and everybody listening to us now and listening, us to, uh, listening to us afterwards. Uh, very pleased to have you with us uh, in today's event, the concluding event of FIP Virtual 2020. It's a pleasure to host everybody here. Very excited to be with you over the next hour, hour and a half. Thank you very much. This is the first series of the FIP Transforming Vaccination Globally and Regionally and the first event introducing the FIP Transforming Vaccination Globally and Regionally series programs, needs, actions and outcomes. Next slide, please. Just a few house announcements before I begin, introduce uh, my co-moderator and everybody here with us today. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed via Facebook. The recording will be freely available on our website, fip.org. You may ask questions using the question box provided and of course, welcome all of your comments, thoughts and reflections through the chat. You are of course welcome to provide feedback about this event any suggestions, improvements, ideas for future events, please email webinars at fip.org. And of course, we'll be happy to welcome you as new members of FIP. If you aren't already, please visit our website for more information on how to become a member. I'm pleased to introduce myself and my co-moderator, Carleen. My name is Lina Badr. I'm the lead for, F uh, for FIP's Workforce Transformation and Development Programs also leading the Transforming Vaccination Globally and Regionally within a whole team. Carleen is also the program coordinator for the Transforming Vaccination um, program. Welcome, Carleen. Hello, Lena. Good to have you with us today. And of course, uh, the big news of the day, it's World Pharmacist Day, 25th of September, and we're very happy to celebrate, uh, celebrate it with all pharmacists and pharmacy workforce around the world in all languages. Um, we're pleased to have you with us today. It's an important day uh, in, a, in very strange circumstances, but also a huge reminder uh, about the role of pharmacists and we should, uh, we should definitely celebrate uh, ourselves. I know we're gonna visit this celebration again Again, towards the end uh, with our president so it won't take too long here but it is it is a pleasure to have you here with us today um, and just a very quick um, introduction to the transforming vaccination globally and regionally program which we'll of course explore through the event but it is the first FIP transformation uh, outcome based online program of its kind it is underpinned by the FIP development goals which have launched earlier this week uh, we are expecting a final outcome of the program to be a historic global FIP commitment to action on vaccination and pharmacy, which we'll have done together in collaboration with all our members around the world. And we are hoping to, uh, we are planning to capture all of the outcomes of this program in a new collection that will be uh, published early 2021. The series or the program is actually divided into three parts or three series running between September and December. Each uh, series consists of eight events uh, surrounding a, a specific theme. Series one, which we're starting today, is around tra identifying transformation needs across practice, science and workforce. And the main outcome of this series will be the identification of needs and considerations for transforming vaccination globally across practice science and of course, workforce and education. The second series, which runs around October, November, is all about setting transformative goals. In this one, we will deconstruct vaccination in pharmacy using the FIP development goals uh, as our framework. And the main outcomes is identifying mechanisms and drivers using the FIP development goals so they can support um, the, the transforming vaccination agenda. Finally, series three is about committing to transformation, where we will deliver a global commitment to action on transformation, and we will explore in this series regional drivers and needs through our members, through and with our members from all around the world, resulting in this historic global commitment. In the next slide, uh, this also shows, uh, shows you all of our important links and resources. Everything about this Transforming Vaccination Regionally and Globally program 
is first of all free and available on transformingvaccination.fiv.org. You are free to browse through all of these uh, event series. All of them are open for registration for free, so please mark them in your calendar, register in advance so you can be with us throughout the entire series. We're also going to engage with you with some questions today. So already we'd like to share them with you to get you thinking as you listen to what we're about to present. Some questions for you and please use the chat to share your thoughts. What single factor should be prioritized to transform pharmacy vaccination services globally and regionally, in your opinion? What would be the most important achievement in terms of pharmacy vaccination services in your country in the next five years, depending on where you are now? What else should the FIP commitment to action outline? And we'll talk a little bit more about what underpins the commitment later today. And in the next slide, just a reminder of what the aim of today is. Really, it's all about setting the agenda and the context for the first series and the entire program, just to help you uh, get along with us and uh, follow through with us until December. We really hope all of you um, stay with us throughout the entire program. And it's about identifying the path forward to empower pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists to contribute to improved vaccination outcomes and uptake, of course. Finally, I am pleased to introduce our two key panelists for today, and we have more as well, whom we'll introduce later on. I'm very pleased to introduce Catherine Duggan, who I think everybody knows, but it's still uh, worth uh, telling you more about all of her achievements and what her role as CEO entails. Dr. Catherine Duggan is the Chief Executive Officer of the International Pharmaceutical Federation, FIP, of course. She took up this role in The Hague in June of 2018. Catherine, as CEO, is responsible for visionary leadership, support, development, and advocacy across more than 150 member organizations and the 4 million members that FIP represents. She is responsible for developing and delivering the strategy, planning, and working across global organizations, such as the WHO and the UN, and other international professional groups, as well as across all our membership organizations, science organizations, academic institutions, and individual members, all of you. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Lena. And uh, Gonzalo Sousa Pinto, here with us today, graduated in pharmacy from the University of Oporto in 2000. He leads the area of development and transformation of the profession at the International Pharmaceutical Federation, where he has worked since 2002. From this role, he promotes innovation and the value of pharmaceutical professional services in the areas of responsible use of medicines, in strategies for the prevention and management of chronic non-communicable diseases, and also infectious diseases, including vaccination services. He monitors the development of pharmaceutical practice worldwide and produces publications and tools to support the work of FIP member organizations in their countries. Well, welcome, Gonzalo. Thank you, Lena, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I won't keep you long. I know we're all burning to hear from our panelists, starting with Catherine. Catherine, over to you. Thank you so much, Lena. Super exciting day for us today. So uh, I'm here to present you a little bit of the history, the present and the way ahead for FIP's work on va vaccination advocacy. So though pharmacists have been delivering vaccination services for decades, uh, when we look back uh, in Argentina, pharmacists have been involved in this since the early 1980s, for example. This role developed as a priority for FIP early last decade in 2011, and it was defined as a key role of community pharmacists in the FIP WHO joint publication on good pharmacy practice guidelines. And since then, our advocacy for this role has really gained momentum with publications, with events, and with various elements that we have been involved in from 2016 to date. We have published uh, various documents and held various summits and events. Next slide, please. Following the uh, advocacy summit in 2018, we built, 2019, apologies, we built on this um, with our founding partner membership for immunization for all ages. That uh, partnership is described as the IFAA co coalition. And 
Gonzalo will address this later. In the last two years, FIP has really accelerated its role in uh, advocacy for vaccination and issued three important publications to support the work of our member organisations. In addition to that, in 2020, the WHO will publish the new immunisation strategy 2030. And as Lena mentioned, and we will go on to discuss later, FIP launched our development goals this week. And these will include indicators and transformation programs for vaccination services for the decade ahead. These two documents will provide a synergistic framework for our work in the next decade. Gonzalo, I'd like to hand over to you. You will provide some context for why vaccination is such a high priority as the main leader in our team of this work. Thank you very much, Catherine and Lena, for the, for the introduction. Um, it is my pleasure to, to provide you this overview of why vaccination is such a high um, priority for global health agenda and also for FIP. And to start with that, we, we, start, we go to the World Health Organization and why the WHO has established vaccination as such a high uh, priority topic for global health policy. And we start with this image, which is from the World Immunization Week campaign for 2020. And that um, every year, the, the WHO organizes this World Immunization Week precisely to advocate and to place the focus on such an important issue. And it's usually at the, on the last week of April. And that's just a few days before the actual World Health Assembly, the, the General Assembly of WHO. And for this year, uh, the WHO had planned to approve or to have approval from member states at the, the World Health Assembly of their new strategy around vaccination for the coming decade until to 2030. And you can see that this campaign for World Immunization Week, whose theme was vaccines work for all, uh, was already a preamble of this uh, new strategic document that would be uh, approved the, the following week or so in, in Geneva. Uh, unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, the World Health Assembly took place with a minimal agenda and therefore the approval of this um, or the adoption of this uh, strategy was postponed, but it's uh, foreseeable that it will be adopted before the end of the year. And one of the key points of this new strategy and what makes it so different or from the previous 10 year strategy on vaccination from WHO is precisely the expansion of vaccination strategies and schedules at country level to include all ages and vaccination throughout the life course. And you can see already in this image that that's precisely what uh, WHO is placing the focus on. And we'll now see a, a, a short video from, from that campaign that will also reinforce that, that message. So thank you, and I just wanted to share that video with you so that we expand actually the World Immunization Week campaign throughout the year to highlight some of the key points on the Immunization Agenda 2030. Um, and just to briefly go uh, through this agenda and walk you through this uh, important policy document uh, and just highlight a couple of, of points. Um, the, there was a, 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 uh, another policy document on WHO's vaccination strategy uh, that was adopted in 2011 for the previous decade that now ends. Uh, and the new document just builds on and addresses the gaps left by the Global Vaccine Action Plan 2011-2020. Uh, and the document sets an ambitious and overarching global vision and strategy for vaccines and immunization for the decade ahead of us. 
uh, and as I expressed before, as, as I said, it will hopefully come into effect by the end of 2020. And this document, and I cite from the document, uh, expresses that through collective endeavor, countries and partners will achieve the vision for the decade, a world where everyone, everywhere, at every age, fully benefits from vaccines for good health and well-being. And we do believe that the pharmacy has a lot to say about this and to contribute to this goal. And this, this document was uh, developed through a series of consultations, naturally to member states, but also to non-state actors and the, the, the non-governmental organizations in official relations with, to, with WHO. And so uh, FIP had the opportunity to provide input to it uh, and also the IFAA, as Catherine just mentioned a little while ago. Um, and also, according to this document, vaccines are critical to the prevention and control of many communicable diseases, as, as, much as, as many as 26 and growing um, uh, communicable diseases, and they therefore underpin global health security. I think that with COVID-19, we have all become very aware of how much uh, the lack of a vaccine uh, actually puts us in such a, uh, a exposes our fragility and our uh, to 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 an, an infectious disease that has no means of uh, being prevented. Um, so the global health security really becomes an issue when vaccines are not uh, fully used or available. Vaccines are also critical for addressing emerging infectious diseases for example, by containing or limiting outbreaks and combating the spread of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, AMR is another of the major global threats that the world is facing. And of course, the use of vaccines reduces the burden of infectious disease and therefore reduces uh, the need for antibiotics uh, to start with. So it's a key component of the fight against antimicrobial resistance. And according to WHO, vaccines will have actually help keep an estimated 24 million people from falling into poverty by 2030, which highlights that vaccines not only have a, a huge impact in terms of uh, health outcomes and the burden of disease, but also in terms of the economies of and the development of our nations. Some of the strategic priority goals outlined in this um, important document, and I will not, of course, uh, go through all of them, but I just wanted to highlight a few that you will see by yourselves that where pharmacy really can have an impact. So in goal number three, everyone is protected by full immunization, regardless of location, age, socioeconomic status, or gender-related barriers. So pharmacy really has and a role at the heart of the communities through their convenience and, and their professional services and the way that they manage medicines and the cold chain to really uh, uh, provide an improved convenience and accessibility vaccination services to the entire community. And uh, goal number four, all people benefit from recommended immunization throughout the life course, effectively integrated with other health, essential health services and a sub uh, objective under this goal is to establish integrated delivery points of contact between immunization and other public health interventions for different target age groups. And I think you can, the, the relationship with the, the potential of community pharmacies is self-evident in this point. Uh, again, from this document, just to um, include in, in this scheme that helps us understand the role that vaccine strategies and vaccination services play in, the, in a wider context. So vaccination strategies are a core element of primary health care and achieving primary health care and delivering primary health care. But also, of course, through primary, primary health care, they contribute to the resilience of health systems. And this contributes to the achievement of universal health coverage. And of course, by achieving universal health coverage, we are contributing widely to the uh, achievement of the sustainable development goals. So as you can see, vaccination services are central to uh, the sustainable development goals. And I give the floor back to you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much, 
Gonzalo. So as we've seen, this is high on WHO agenda and FIP has firmly advocated to the World Health Organization and the member states and expressed the readiness of our profession to play the central role in vaccination strategies in all countries we need to play. Here we have two short clips of our colleagues, Gonzalo, who you have with you in, uh, in real life, and Susanna Kosinova, speaking at the World Health Organization Executive Board meeting on this subject. Let's play the video. With adequate training, community pharmacists are perfectly competent to perform a series of roles that can significantly contribute to improving vaccination coverage from providing evidence-based advice on vaccines, to administering vaccines, and to managing vaccination records. We urge the WHO to promote and member states to expand the roles of pharmacists in vaccine administration. The time is right to update the legal and regulatory requirements and to provide the appropriate remuneration and incentives for a public health service that clearly generates savings, both for the patients and health systems, as well as decreases burden on physicians. With so colleagues, um, we can see that vaccination goes beyond a central global health priority. And when we look at the sustainable development goals, the 17 of them, we can actually identify that immunization is linked to 14 of the 17 SDGs. For this reason, recently launched FIP development goals align the work of FIP with global health and sustainable development priorities. The 21 FIP development goals outline the priority areas across our profession, linking and uniting science, practice, workforce and education, all of which are interrelated to deliver our one FIP agenda and strategy. These were launched on Monday of this week, World Pharmacy Week, and really set the pathway for the decade ahead aligned to the SDGs. Let's watch a video of the FIP development goals. So much team and I know Lena has put a link in the chat box about where you can find all the resources. So colleagues, as I did with the sustainable development goals a few moments ago, we'll do the same with the development goals that we launched this week. So we can see that pharmacy-based vaccination and vaccine-related services are linked to 17 of the 21 FIP development goals with a central role in seven of them, such as FIP development goal number 10, equity, in access to vaccination services of, across all ages. This will become incredibly important when we see the emerging COVID vaccines, please God. FIP development goal 11, impact and outcomes, and not only in terms of disease burden and healthy living, but also economic outcomes, education and social gains. 
FIP development goal number 15, people-centred care, namely by providing more convenient and accessible vaccination services in the community. FIP development goal 16, communicable diseases, the most overtly linked one, of course, but let's not forget how vaccination is so central for the management of non-communicable uh, diseases, NCDs as well. FIP development goal 17, antimicrobial stewardship, you will all be aware that we launched our AMR commission yesterday, which was a fabulous event as well. Vaccines are absolutely central in strategies to curb AMR. FIP development goal 18, improved access to medicines, devices and services, goes without saying. And FIP development goal 19, patient safety, which is such an important element in vaccine development and delivery. And as we're seeing now in the clinical research into COVID vaccines. Super important. In the previous slide, I mentioned that the 21 FIP development goals outline the priority areas across our profession, linked to science, practice, workforce and education. They're all interrelated to, to deliver our one FIP strategy. We commit to working with all of our constituencies locally, regionally and globally. And we plan to align the work on vaccinations with the development goals and across our regions and their needs. Along with concrete and tangible mechanisms, the FIP Development Goals package will include tools and structures to facilitate and support the process of transformation. FIP is here to support, not to dictate. Through regional engagement, we will support the development of roadmaps for the regions and the countries within, and work with closer and closer with our regional forums to do so. Indicators and country level metrics will be developed as a way to measure and monitor progress via the data we collect through the FIP Global Pharmaceutical Observatory. And we held an event on, on the observatory and the commission around the observatory on Wednesday of this week. I urge you all to look at that recording. Finally, national transformation programs, such as the FIP Workforce Transformation Program we have under, underway, will provide a pathway for needs assessments for each nation for them to be able to prioritise and implement action plans tailored to each country's needs. Again, FIP will never dictate, FIP will just support. Lena mentioned earlier on with series two, see that we have um, a deconstruction of the development goals to discuss mechanisms and drivers to progress. The most re relevant FIP development goals will be explored in the context of transforming vaccination. We urge you all to register for these events and there is a website you can find on the slides. We have developed several resources for our member organisations and individual practitioners as well. Support the implementation, the expansion of this role and I'll hand back to Gonzalo for a brief overview of the re these resources which will be very good for us to revisit. Gonzalo. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, yes, uh, there is a whole library of resources and publications uh, developed by FIP over the, in the last few years that can support the work not only of our member organisations but also individual practitioners uh, in implementing or expanding their role around vaccines and not only in vaccination delivery but also in the provision of evidence-based advice, uh, education, addressing uh, myths and uh, vaccine hesitancy and and several other roles uh, that can contribute altogether to um, improving vaccination coverage, even in countries where uh, the delivery of vaccination services, uh, the administration of vaccines is not yet authorized by pharmacists for pharmacists. So the, the first uh, important publication that FIP produced uh, on, in this area was um, in 2016. Uh, this was the baseline survey report on the role of pharmacists uh, on immunization. This publication was led by Professor Ian Bates and Dr. Elena Rosado um, and set the basis really for the, um, the work of FIP with data around the role of pharmacists on vaccination. In 2019, we uh, issued a vaccination advocacy toolkit for our member organizations. This um, shares um, the best practices and tactical approaches from other organizations so to support their own processes at national level in introducing pharmacy-based vaccination services. 
than this year, 2020, we issued a version of this publication addressed at individual practitioners and anyone who is interested uh, with that provides a selection of evidence of the impact of pharmacists' roles in immunization, but also practical guidance on how to develop a vaccination service in your own pharmacy, for example. So this is a more hands-on publication, let's say, uh, for everyone. And uh, in August, just about a month ago, we launched uh, the, the, the report from our global survey, uh, which updates the situation and the data we had from the 2016 survey. And from this report, we would just like to highlight uh, a few um, information and findings that uh, are particularly relevant for this, uh, for this um, webinar. Uh, this is a world map of the countries and territories that have or not uh, pharmacy-based vaccination. And from uh, a sample of 101 countries, uh, you can see that uh, the yellow countries, let's say, uh, colored in yellow, are the ones that do not yet have pharmacy-based vaccination. So we still have uh, a lot of work to do uh, ahead of us. But if you compare it with the situation in 2016, and this is only the countries that had pharmacy-based vaccination uh, back then, it was 16 countries, we can see that the map is becoming more colorful uh, as time goes by. Um, and we now have 36 countries uh, with pharmacy-based vaccination. And we asked uh, also our member organizations if there are any developments or any plans to introduce pharmacy-based vaccination in the next few years. And we found out that actually in an, in, a, in an additional 16 countries, there are such plans. So by 2025, we hope this map will have 52 countries uh, already um, with, with such services provided by pharmacies. And actually, if we think of it, this survey was conducted at the, when, when the pandemic was just beginning, or actually even before we launched the survey in, in December 2019. And we've seen that in many countries, the pandemic has actually accelerated this transformation. So maybe by 2025, this map will actually be more blue or bluer than, than we expected it to be um, before the pandemic. Also from this survey, we, we saw that the, the 15 most commonly administered vaccines at pharmacies uh, are of course influenza is the most commonly administered vaccine, but also hepatitis B, diphtheria, tetanus, uh, hepatitis A, and measles and pertussis are other commonly administered vaccines and several others as you can see on this image. Um, but we asked about 36 uh, different vaccines and, and actually for all of them there were at least a few countries that had uh, that vaccine ad uh, administered at pharmacies. And uh, now moving on to a coalition that uh, Catherine already um, referred to previously in her presentation, which is the Immunization for All Ages Coalition that FIP is very proud to be a member of. We joined this coalition when it was founded in 2018 uh, or 19. Um, and we have been, uh, and this brings together a series of organizations that have different missions and visions, but have an aligned agenda around the, the imperative to improve vaccination coverage worldwide. Uh, and this includes the World Federation of Public Health Associations, the International Federation on Aging, the Confederation of Meningitis Organizations, the United Nations Foundation Shorted Life Campaign, the International Longevity Center, and Dr. Justin Ortiz is an expert member from the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health at the University of Maryland in the United States, and of course FIP. And this coalition is supported by Pfizer. So uh, IFAA issued a manifesto earlier this year uh, for the promotion of immunization throughout the life course that has the following three pillars. Prioritizing prevention. Um, just bear with me for a second. So the, the manifesto actually uh, calls on national and international health and advocacy organizations and governments 
to prioritize immunization throughout life as a key pillar of expanded prevention strategies and a central component of universal health coverage. The second pillar is ensuring access for all to vaccination services. And the, the manifesto in this uh, regard calls on governments and other agencies to expand their and their work and their advocacy to remove barriers to access for appropriate immunization throughout life to ensure that all people are protected against prevent vaccine preventable diseases. And finally, the third pillar of this manifesto is to reduce inequity. And we called on all stakeholders uh, including governments and all international organizations to reduce inequalities in the timely, appropriate and affordable access to immunization throughout life. We are thankful to our partners in IFAA to supporting the, say, this common and shared agenda uh, around improving vaccination throughout the life course. And also together with the IFAA partners, we will be uh, organizing and delivering a series of three webinars, uh, mostly focusing on policy and advocacy action. The first one will be on Thursday, the 8th of October, and we invite you all to participate. Uh, with, with the theme will be driving policy to action precisely. So now that we have all these frameworks and documents from WHO and other organizations, how do we actually drive that policy into concrete action uh, at country level? And back to Lena, I believe. Thank you very much. Good evening. Now it's time to hear from our panel. I think I might start with Lena O'Brien. She is a pharmacist and the founder and CEO of PharmaPod LTD, a global company that has developed a pioneering software platform to reduce medication errors and provide safe, effective clinical services such as vaccination for patients worldwide. Leonora has over 25 years experience in community pharmacy practice, policy development and regulatory affairs. Her former roles include being chief pharmacist for Unicare, the largest pharmacy group in Ireland, consultant for the PSI, the pharmacy regulator in the IRL, and European manager for Silicio AG, a group of 2,300 pharmacies where she had accountability for patient safety and professional services strategy. Leonora is an ambassador for Women in STEM, and she was announced as European Laureate in the Cartier Women's Initiative Awards and as Businesswoman of the Year in Ireland 2020, and is a finalist in this year's EY Entrepreneur of the Year. So, Leonora O'Brien, I might start by asking you a question. So, how has pharmacist vaccination affected patient safety? So I'm just honored to be with everybody today and happy World Pharmacies, Pharmacist Day to everybody. Um, it's, it's just fantastic to be here talking about such an important and, and um, timely um, uh, topic. So I, I would firstly encourage everybody listening to, to read that FIP report, the, the global report, because um, it, it is such a significant report and, and the first and most comprehensive of, of its kind. So. It, as Gonzalo mentioned, it, it, it outlines how pharmacy-based vaccinations are already uh, available in 36 countries and it's been proposed in an additional 16. So that's so significant and, and, and that is why you know, we are here. So it's estimated that over 10 million lives per year can be saved by increasing access to, to medicines and vaccinations. So when we talk about patient safety in the pharmacy, of course, you know, pharmacists will think of specific elements of their practice or their, their service provision that we need to consider to protect patients. But ensuring that pharmacists contribute to the vaccination programs in the first place ha has the greatest impact on, on patient safety. And we need to make sure that that happens. Um, you know, we're ideally placed to contribute um, and to lead on these vaccination initiatives. When you consider, for example, 46 million people in, in Europe visit a pharmacy every day. So, so nobody needs to be left behind um, for vaccinations. So in, in relation to how uh, pharmacists um, vaccination services have affected patient safety, um, there, there are many ways to, to measure the impact 
of a vaccination service on patient safety and, and the healthcare system as a whole. Um, and, and many of these are, are, you know, measures are quantifiable. So if we look at the, the eight main categories of patient safety, um, it involves in, uh, achieved patient safety goals. Did we achieve the patient treatment goals um, as a patient outcome? Did we avoid adverse effects? Uh, have we decreased the length of time that the patients stay in, in the hospitals or rehabilitation facility? Decreased number of visits for emer emergency care? And um, of course, for patients, en enhanced quality of life and, and patient satisfaction are hugely important. And they're, they're actually patient safety criteria. Um, did we prevent medication errors? And, and also the, the reduced cost. So cost is actually, you know, a category under patient safety. You know, if, if patients can't afford the service in the first instance, then they, they can't be immunized. So that, that is a really significant one. Um, so how do we measure, how does it achieve patient treatment goals? Well, it, it's well documented in, in pharmacy now, we've seen in reports such as the FI vaccination report, that the pharmacist's role in providing public health advice, signposting the, the, the patients to vaccination services has a hugely positive impact. Um, and, and then uh, also administering the vaccines at community pharmacy level has a positive impact on vaccine uptake uh, and in turn the reduction of the disease. Um, in Ireland, for example, and I'm based in Ireland at, at the moment, this is the 10th season in which Irish community pharmacies have been involved in, in the flu, vac flu vaccination campaign. And the first year that pharmacies can, can offer flu vaccinations to children as, as young as two years of age. So that's been a huge success. Um, the pharmacists have managed to increase awareness of, of the vaccination program through the promotion of the service, and it's led to an overall increase of 60% with 1.1 million vaccines distributed last year. Um, so it, it's also been demonstrated and well documented that community pharmacy can contribute to increasing the vaccination uptake of, of at-risk groups and using their, their patient medication records to identify the at-risk patients and follow through. Um, of course, with their expanding scope of practice across the, the world, pharmacists are now recognized as, as key components in providing the individualized patient care as, as part of our um, interprofessional healthcare team. So pharmacists also, of course, um, um, on a, a service level, we avoid the, the adverse side effects, which is a hugely important um, domain of patient safety. Uh, when designing the pharmacy vaccination services, pharmacists build this aspect in to their service. You know, we, we counsel patients in the first instance to make sure that they're eligible and, and suitable for the vaccine. Um, we review the, the patient's medication records, so we pre-qualify the patients. Um, we have a, a pharmacovigilance aspect to the, the service. So we, we follow up with our patients. We maintain accurate records to make sure um, the, the, the accurate records of the vaccine administered are kept. Uh, of course, anaphylaxis as well, um, you know, in terms of the, the service being provided itself, the, the pharmacist is trained in the administration of adrenaline and CPR. And of course, um, you know, the, the, if, if a patient comes into the pharmacy, for example, um, the, the vaccine is administered and the, the, the pharmacist um, will have the patient wait for about at least 15 minutes uh, there with them in the pharmacy in case of anaphylactic yeah. shock. So there, there is so many elements across the pharmacy uh, provision of the service itself that impacts on patient safety. Um, but it, it, an important patient safety category is the, the improved patient satisfaction. Um, and, and what is you know, patient satisfaction? So it, it's often how the, the, the service has impacted on their quality of life. It can be the cost of care, as I mentioned, or how satis satisfied they are with the quality of service and the advice that with the, received within the pharmacy and how smooth that service ran for them and what their experience was. Um, and, and let's remind ourselves, so, you know, pharmacists are constantly rated as top rated, uh, trusted professionals. Um, for example, in Ireland, a study last year, uh, a, a, an index um, showed that pharmacists are the second most trusted professional overall, just 1% behind nurses, and that can, can vary. So across all the professions, we are constantly uh, one of the most trusted professionals. So, um, 
uh, you know, patient satisfaction. We've well demonstrated the, the trust in the profession. Um, and the scenes are, um, you know, it, it, the vaccination and the immunization programs, um, we need to consider how cost effective uh, they are in dealing with. Um, We're having a little trouble hearing from Leonora at the moment. Um, I might see if we move forward and I introduce Farah Aquat um, and just do a little bio for Farah and we'll wait for Leonora to come back on. So Farah Aquat graduated at, with a BSc and a Doctor of Pharmacy from the University of Jordan in 2020. She's been actively engaged in leading a strategic vision and activities to advance the role of young pharmacists in public health, as she served as the president of Jordan's Pharmaceutical Students Association, JPSA, which is a member organization at the International Pharmaceutical Students Federation. Farah is the project coordinator for the FIP transformation of vaccination globally and regionally. So Farah, welcome. And she's going with the theme of transforming vaccination the expanding role of pharmacy profession, a viewpoint of a young pharmacist. So Farah might ask you the first question. So as a young pharmacist who has just begun her professional journey, in your point of view, how does the limitation of pharmacist authority in administering vaccinations possess a challenge to pharmacists? Okay, thank you, Carlene, and happy Pharmacist Day. Uh, in my opinion, limitation of pharmacy vaccination possesses a challenge not only to pharmacists, but also to the community. And since our vision in the pharmacy profession is patient oriented, this is a major problem for us. When I started my profession journey, either before or after graduating, I noticed that pharmacists in general, specifically community pharmacists, have a label with a conventional role known as selling medications. Clinical services known to be provided in pharmacies are very limited. The global commitment of Astana's declaration includes building sustainable primary health care, and as we all know, immunization is a vital umbrella under primary health care. But despite the existence of effective vaccines, the potential health benefits of vaccinations are not being fully achieved due to suboptimal vaccine coverage rate. And this leaves us to the burden of vaccine preventable diseases, which is still high. Um, ease of accessibility is potentially modifiable. It's a modifiable determinant in vaccine uptake because as we all know, pharmacists are often among us the most accessible healthcare professionals, um, either via community pharmacies and are the first point of contact for many patients' health issues. Pharmacy vaccination will improve the diversity of settings where vaccines can be provided, increase the number of available opportunities for vaccinations, and therefore it might decrease the number of vaccine preventable illnesses. We will also allow the cognitive services of pharmacists. So in addition to increasing the consultation capacity, the management therapy, reviewing plans, patient programs, adherence programs, it's all an excellent step to deliver services. It's a chance to work with patients and have that one-to-one -one contact getting from behind the counter and actually giving an actual service where patients rely on pharmacists for being the primary health care. Pharmacy vaccination will also vaccinate, facilitate the vaccination programs because in my opinion, it will overcome the inconveniences associated with clinics, such as opening hours, making an appointment, waiting with other patients in the reception, so to sum up, limitation of pharmacy vaccination is preventing a basic efficient, accessible, cost-effective, and a favorable immunization service. Thank you, Carlene. Thank you, Farah. Um, so my next question is for Gonzalo. Under the theme of advocating for pharmacy-based vaccination, background and the way forward. So the question for Gonzalo is the FIP has been advocating for an expanded role by pharmacists in vaccination for some time now. Could you highlight key moments in that history and examples of countries that regulated pharmacy-based vaccination during that time? Thank you, Carleen. Yes, I mean, uh, I think that the maps that uh, I showed earlier in this presentation really show that this has been gaining momentum and there has been an acceleration in the number of countries that have introduced uh, pharmacy-based vaccination. 
And, and this has really accelerated since 2016, 17, which coincides with when FIP really also started prioritizing um, vaccination efficacy more. And of course, it, it cannot all be traced uh, back to, uh, to FIP's work on this. It's, it has mainly to do with the work of our member organizations in their countries, but FIP has been putting this on the agenda of the WHO. It has been putting this on the agenda of our congresses and council and, and other uh, meetings that we have organized so that it's um, shared, uh, that this priority is shared with our member organizations and we provide them with the tools and the advocacy support to actually achieve these changes. We have seen, for example, how France introduced uh, a pilot project in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, that was so successful initially it was only in two uh, regions of, of the country and only with a flu vaccination and then it was expanded uh, to four regions and then the <clears throat> and then to the whole country and we have seen for example that Jordan introduced pharmacy based vaccination just a few days ago uh, and also Brazil introduced it in 2017 as well for example um, and and also for example this this very week, uh, Norway has expanded the role of pharmacists in vaccination by authorizing them to administer the flu vaccine without the need for a medical prescription, for example. So we've seen changes in many countries. Lithuania is introducing it this, this year as well. So these are very, very recent changes. Israel also introduced it in 2017 or 18. So there have been many changes in, uh, in several countries uh, and we're very happy to see how our member organizations have taken up this um, as an important priority for them to, uh, to introduce at country level. Thank you, Gonzalo. So now I'd like to hand back to Gonzalo to discuss the events he's delivered on and increasing vaccination coverage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlene. Yes, so we would just in parallel with this, um, well, in, not in parallel, but actually before uh, this series that we are now starting today, uh, we also uh, organized a series of 10 other online events, several of which uh, actually took place uh, during the, the virtual Congress of FIP. So we started in July uh, and, and this series will continue until January 2021. And the series is focused precisely on increasing vaccination coverage through pharmacists and addresses the several uh, uh, topics that are related to this subject. And we have uh, collaborated with a series of uh, partners in, in these events. And just to go through very briefly through the topics that we have already covered in different events. Uh, the first one was called Winter is Coming. So we stole that line from Game of Thrones. But just um, this was organized in July uh, when winter was already uh, not coming, but already there uh, in the southern hemisphere. Um, and we had, all, and this was a few months into the pandemic. So we wanted to learn from our member organizations and countries in the Southern Hemisphere, how they were dealing with um, the coincidence or the um, uh, coexistence of the two um, diseases, COVID-19 and uh, seasonal influenza and how pharmacies were responding to this uh, challenging and new situation. Um, this was the first episode. The second one was had to do with uh, vaccine hesitancy and was called Who is Immune to Fake News? Uh, addressing patient motivation and vaccine hesitancy, which included a presentation from the International um, uh, Federation on Aging uh, and also from our member organization in Ireland, the, the Irish Pharmacy Union, but also a psychologist from Italy, Dr. Katarina Suttner, who is specialized in dealing with um, fake news and how uh, people develop opinions on health subjects, for example, based on information that is circulating on the internet. We then presented uh, in early August the report that I mentioned to you. So this was a, a sort of a, a focused present um, webinar to present the findings of the report. And then uh, on the 3rd of September, we organized a session uh, called Give It a Shot, advocating for pharmacy-based vaccination and achieving legislative changes. 
uh, which uh, shared some experiences, for example, from France, uh, as I mentioned before, but also how uh, the educational institutions are preparing pharmacists, uh, schools of pharmacy are preparing pharmacists for vaccination roles, and also a presentation from the International Longevity Center from by David Sinclair. And then already during our Congress, our a roundtable discussion on the subject of can the world afford low vaccination coverage rates, broadening vaccination gateways through pharmacies. That included uh, uh, Dr. Anne Lindstrand from the WHO, but also um, the International Federation on Aging again, and the pharmaceutical group of the European Union and the European Patient Forum, in addition to a keynote presentation by Sonia Queiroz uh, from the National Association of Pharmacies of Portugal. And of course, uh, some words from our president and CEO as well. We then we had an event focusing on influenza vaccination and specifically on the development, supply and delivery for optimal prevention of the flu in cooperation with IFPMA and our member organization in Norway. Uh, and then just a few days ago, we had an event on the value of vaccines for society, but also for specific populations uh, with uh, Dr. Michael Moore uh, from the World Federation of Public Health Associations and Dr. Justin Ortiz from the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health from Maryland. And there's three events still uh, upcoming in this series. Uh, the first one on the 22nd of October uh, will again address the issue of winter coming and flu vaccination during the COVID-19 pandemic, but will be with in French and targeting uh, the Francophone countries. Uh, and then we will have another one on the two more events that will have a more hands-on approach. A uh, more training approach for individual practitioners, one of them focusing on vaccine safety and also on building confidence in vaccines. And the final one in January, focusing on vaccination procedures and common errors. So we do invite you to stay uh, tuned and then and, and to join these events. Uh, back to uh, the moderators. Thank you. Thank you for this, Gonzo. This was just a, uh, another slide we've already shared earlier, but thank you so much for an overview of all these great events that you have led and organized. And I think it's timely that we continue this discussion within the Transformation Vaccination Program, uh, which again, uh, we are launching today. It will continue until December. I am sending lots of links through the chat on how to register for upcoming events. It's a packed schedule, but really we would want uh, you to be with us and help us in delivering this commitment. So I just wanted to mention that um, on top of all of this uh, great showcase from you, Gonzo. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, and now we'll start our panel discussion and I'll hand over to Carlene for moderation. But I do have a question for Catherine actually to begin the discussion from the audience and then I'll hand over to you Carlene to, um, to help us with the other um, panelists. So the question is from Luna uh, to you Catherine, uh, Luna Bizri from Lebanon. Now with the COVID pandemic, lots of patients would like to be vaccinated with a flu shot, but it seems that at least in Lebanon, we will have a shortage in vaccines. So back to the equity issue, how can we have equitable vaccination in these moments? And by the way, she says they didn't receive till now the flu vaccine in their country in terms of as a delivery service. So how can we achieve equity and equality in this issue? So um, to note colleagues, this is like a system wide pro uh, problem. And um, Dominique and I working with all of our regional colleagues have identified drug shortages previously as a big issue for our profession. And it's heightened this year. In fact, everything to do with pharmacy and the problems we may have identified in the past is heightened this year. So what I would suggest is that each country would um, seek some support from us and we will try and do some advocacy at the relevant uh, agencies. For Lebanon in particular, we, sh we should be using um, 
organizations like Gavi to unlock some supply issues, especially for influenza vaccine, because this year we know that it's um, a personal responsibility for each of us as health professionals to be vaccinated against flu as we head into the winter with COVID in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we've watched some of our colleagues in the Southern Hemisphere learn lessons through this um, pandemic. And I think it's the sharing of the knowledge of that um, and refer back to Gonzo's point on that. But um, I think Lena really, um, and Luna, thank you so much for the question. It's worth us noting that all policymakers have identified the drug shortage issue as a major risk in vaccinations for this year because we are also going through COVID as well. So we need to be political with a small p and we need to be advocating at the right tables to support various um, countries. And I see in the chat box a lot of discussions and learning from Jordan, for example, where perhaps advocacy from that country can help Lebanon as well. Thank you for that, Catherine. And before I pass on to Carlina, I just want to mention that um, our next event in the series, which we'll promote shortly, actually showcases the different models from different countries different stages of delivering this service and I think it would be really really valuable for everybody to join that and, and listen from these different our members really on how they've done it and how we at FIP can support you in your countries. Passing on to you Carleen um, for the rest of the question. Great thank you. So I might go back to Leonora um, and I might start off with you and ask you the next question. Um, are there ways that pharmacist vaccination services can be improved to further benefit patient safety? Just checking to see if we can hear Leonora. We may have... Hi, Leonora. Hi, Carleen. Hi. So, Hi. so thank you for the question. Um, well, firstly, we need to improve the, the legislation and regu regulations, um, and, and as Catherine mentioned, to, to drive changes in vaccination policies at a national level. Uh, and it does, it takes political commitment um, to drive the e equitable delivery of care that Ca Catherine mentioned in, in, um, at, at the start. So, uh, you know, on Gonzalo's map, we have to aim for full blue on, on that map, on that the global report. So we, we, we know that pharmacy-based vaccinations are already available in 36 countries, but you know, pharmacists should be able to contribute to, to vaccinations of all the 26 vaccine-preventable disease states and, and not just you know, flu um, or temporary contributions during a, a pandemic such as, such as COVID. So we need to remove any barriers for, for universal vaccination programmes to be successful. Um, for example, access to the vaccine you know, it should be made as simple as possible and it should be universally state funded if, if possible. Um, we need to lobby for, for governance, uh, governments to make uh, flu vaccines available for, for, for um, everyone over six months, depending on, on, on the, the um, vaccines, of course, um, but for, certainly for flu vaccines. Um, also, what we need to aim for is consistency, not only in the guidelines and, and regulations, um, but you know, also the experience, the patient experience across the pharmacies at the at the moment may may vary. Um, so we need to ensure that there's clear guidance uh, based on best practice. And at the moment, they are, they can slightly vary from country to country depending on the local regulations. Um, so it, it, uh, some regulators would think it might be too prescriptive to to give certain data fields or consultation. Um, uh, advice or guidance and yes there's a, there's a real benefit to standardizing how we roll out these services um, and what questions that the, the, the pharmacists are asking because it drives the consistency of, of service provision and also the data that's collected then can be put forward to to lobby for future service and and, and to demonstrate the value that we're adding as, as a profession so you know certainly to do that what we need is, is, is digitization of the service um, for every for sustainability of, of pharmacy services, we need to have an effective infrastructure behind all of these, or, or any service across the healthcare sector. Um, it's cr critical for sustainability. So, you know, we've seen in pharmacy, you know, some lost opportunities in the past where we haven't um, put a robust infrastructure, like a digitization of the service in parallel with the rollout of the service. 
we need to have digitization and IT platforms to help us measure and, and feedback on, on vaccination coverage rates in real time. Um, you know, the benefits are that it's very scalable immediately. Uh, it enables the authorities in each country to, to collect the real time data uh, to see what the status is, inter, you know, nationally and also, you know, share this data on an international basis. Um, it standardizes the, 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 the patient experience as well um, if, if, if the service is rolled out in a, in a standardized way. Um, and, and another thing that, that is really, you know, should, would drive patient safety in the countries is having a national learning system set up whereby, you know, pharmacists and, and their various, um, you know, healthcare professional colleagues can put in their um, issues that they've had with a particular service, such that they, they're learning from each other um, any issues that have happened with a, with a drug or um, with, with the service provision itself or any errors that have occurred. And, you know, I'll give an example. Um, in Ireland, when we launched the flu service across pharmacies back in 2011, um, for example, there, there were issues with underdosing in particular pharmacies. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is because it was dealt with it within, with such efficiency that you know you could really be proud of the governance that was um, put in place and every single healthcare service that you know um, no matter where it is in the healthcare system will have issues associated with it. But if you haven't got a system to to capture the learning, then it's a really missed opportunity. And, you know, and in that case, for example, the underdosing was due to. A, a particular training that was provided and there was black line mark, markings on the syringe itself. And so there was packaging issues. Um, but that had actually happened in the hospital environment and, and it wasn't picked up and shared with other healthcare professionals. So unfortunately that learning was missed. So to have a system where we can learn uh, and, and a quality improvement system uh, and also of course we, we need to ensure the right governance within the pharmacy itself. Um, we need to have the professional management, um, the, the governance again um, of, of that. Have we got the right protocols in place, the right lines of accountability within the pharmacy um, and resourcing? Do we have adequate pharmacist training and support staff to, to, to cover the provision of the service within the pharmacies? Of course, there's regulations to, to cover premises and facilities across the different um, countries. Um, stock management and, and disposal to ensure that they're all done safely and and even down to the pa patient consultation area um you know the, the, there is frameworks in place in many of the countries to define how that patient consulta consultation area looks so we need to make sure that um you know that the standard of, of service has it, it's taking place in the right environment as well for the patient um so a, a contractual frameworks really help as well um to, for, to make sure that these private consultation areas are um, a, a, a standard thing for the service. Thank you, Leonora. Now I'll pass on to Lena to share some questions that have been asked by the audience. Thank you, Carlene. Um, lots and lots of questions coming in. It's very hard to pick and choose, so we'll try and cover as many of them as possible. This is just a reminder for, a reminder for everyone to please send your questions to the question and answer box as we might miss them in the chat. So I have a question here uh, from Hyun Jin Kang from Korea. I figured out during my research on vaccine hesitancy that vaccine hesitancy is very prone to the context of the local settings, such as culture, religion, etc. Do you think that intervention by pharmacists can mitigate vaccine hes hesitancy, or do you see it as a matter of the health system? All of our panelists are welcome to answer, but I think I'll pass on to Gonzalo because I do know we've done an entire event just about vaccine hesitancy, and hearing some of these lessons from that would be really helpful. Gonzalo. Thank you very much, Lena, and thank you for this question. Uh, not only have we organized uh, events focusing on this, and our publications also touch upon this, but we will be working even further on vaccine hesitancy in the coming year, uh, because it is a, a critical uh, aspect of achieving higher vaccination coverage. There's a lot of uh, fake news, a lot of um, misinformation and, and evidence uh, information that is not based on evidence of any sort circulating on the internet and of course when it comes to a mother um, or a, a, 
a parent uh, wanting to vaccinate their child or uh, for, for themselves, for, for the adults themselves or for an older adult, people are quite uh, sometimes doubting or hesitating whether a vaccine will be safe and effective or necessary even. Uh, and therefore, the, there's a, they look for information on the internet and sometimes they get even more confused uh, and get a, a false information or a false idea of, of around the safety of, of vaccines. Uh, vaccines go through a very rigorous um, clinical research uh, and through various phases to demonstrate not only their efficacy, but also and most especially their safety. Uh, so they do not enter the market lightly without having gone through extensive testing and demonstrating their efficacy and safety. So uh, vaccines are actually, according to the WHO, um, one of the major um, assets and resources to uh, fight uh, vaccine preventable diseases and infectious diseases second only to clean water. So um, they are perfectly safe to use, uh, but it's important that pharmacists understand uh, the local culture, the local uh, factors that may contribute to, to hesitancy in their community, because they may be different in a country or in a different region, or as you said, as the question said, depending on not only the culture, but the religion and several other factors. So some of these elements will be common to many countries, but some will be um, depending on the local culture and local religion, for example, or, or even sometimes on uh, a case of a reaction to, an, an, uh, to a vaccine that takes place in a country and then the community in that country becomes a bit reluctant to use vaccines. So I think that it's a combination. It's uh, health systems that need to combat hesitancy, but also community pharmacists are ideally placed to understand uh, both general and specific factors and be able to advise the community based on facts and, and evidence. Thank you for that, Gonzo. And uh, we just got another question about where can we find reliable resources? And I, I, I recommended WHO, obviously ministry, local ministries, and of course our resources at FIP will always try and make sure that they are up to date uh, and factual. Thank you for that, Gonzalo. I'll pass on to Carlene because I know she has a question to Farah. Hi there. Can I ask you, recently Jordan has witnessed a transformational journey. Pharmacists are authorised to administer influenza vaccines and contribute to immunisation. How does that affect the pharmacy profession from your viewpoint as a young pharmacist? And can you reflect on where Jordan is in regards to pharmacy vaccination and where it could be? Okay, thank you, Carlene. So in the Amman Commitment to Action on Healthcare on 2019, Jordan committed to encourage our pharmacy workforce to contribute more to primary healthcare by administering vaccination. On April 2020, pharmacists were approved to administer seasonal influenza vaccines. Administration of influenza vaccine by pharmacists has the potential to positively affect public health by improving vaccination rates among high-risk patients, first-time or occasional vaccine recipients, and patients who might not have a chance to be or an opportunity to be vaccinated. This first step in providing direct patient care is a positive step for a more collaborative practices in the future of Jordanian pharmacists. It gives us pharmacists a more prominent role in public health. Uh, in Jordan, we don't have a national vaccination program for adults provided by the government. We only have it from private sectors. So this is an opportunity for pharmacists to engage in administering and developing future vaccination plans for patients. It is actually rewarding to our role as primary health care practitioners when the community realizes pharmacists are involved in the care of patients. Uh, Jordan is heading to establish well-developed training programs at the meantime. Um, it's for the pharmacist in the administration and storage of vaccination and uh, the prompt vaccination recommendations and reminders. Uh, the immunization advocacy project is now led by Dr. Samira Shamas and the Jordan Pharmaceutical Association and um, now proceeding with the training to empower community pharmacists as immunizers. This will be explained by Dr. Samira in the upcoming event. So basically, as a young pharmacist, I hope we could expand pharmacist vaccination services to include administration of other common vaccines. Uh, thank you, Karnine. Thank you, Fana. Now I'll pass on to Lena to share another question from the audience. Thank you very much, uh, Karlene. Thank you for that, Fana. 
Uh, I have a question from Olegbenga Adrulo. Uh, how can pharmacists build up a collaborative network to help regions that have difficulties in vaccination by pharmacists through engagement with governments by this regional slash international collaboration? And I think Olegbenga uh, Oleg already has sent another comment in the chat about how can Africa as a region and how can FIP support um, such an agenda on a regional level. I think maybe I'll pass on to our CEO, Catherine, who can expand on what we're doing on a regional level to support our members. Uh, thank you, Lena. I think um, what we would like to do is work with our African Forum and also with our member organisations to identify where this sits as a priority across all the African nations and then develop a regional uh, roadmap, if you like. Um, roadmap is our word of the week. We uh, really see this as a way in which we can visualize where we're going, where we're headed and how we can get there. And what we know works, um, Gonzo has gone through all of the publications, through our advocacy toolkits, we have ways in which we can um, advocate at policy level, advocate at government level, um, start conversations with uh, the WHO in that region, um, really start to make the case for the benefit to the population of having pharmacists as vaccinators. Um, maybe even bringing colleagues in from other countries um, and other regions that can show and showcase. And uh, Gonzo has got lots of examples of how that really has worked. It's often difficult to advocate within your country, but if someone comes from another country to demonstrate benefit, it can really change minds. And then there may be some changes needed to legislations and regulations, which other countries have also had to go through. So what I would say is let's work with our regional forum on this, identify the extent of this priority across all the African nations. For me, it's got to be up there, but you know, it's not for FIP to say. But then I think there's a lot of learning and a lot of steps that can be jumped over using the, the tools that we have. And um, FIP is here to support all of that as well. Um, so it's about how can we support the regional endeavor? And if we can do it as a region and support all the countries within that region as far as possible, you make a bigger impact for uh, the effort that you're um, making and hopefully quicker. Thanks for that, Catherine. And on that note, I just want to remind everybody or direct everybody to series three of this um, of this program will actually focus on regional level drivers and barriers and we'll have six meetings for each of the six regions of the world um, to address these specific issues. So please tune in for that uh, in November, December. Um, passing on to Carlene again. Great. So I might ask Gonzalo the next question. Um, this year, the FIP has placed a particularly strong focus on pharmacists' role in expanding vaccination coverage linked to the COVID-19 pandemic. What are the next steps and what can FIP members expect? Yes, sorry, I was muted. Um, well, as I mentioned, we will continue to work. I mean, this uh, series that we will be delivering until the end of the year, uh, that will end or culminate with this uh, commitment to action uh, to, that we will invite our member organizations other other stakeholders to to uh, to endorse uh, and then to transpose not only to endorse and to sign a document but actually that means that they will transpose these documents and this call to action to their country level uh, discussions and, and and advocate for a stronger role for pharmacists in uh, in the vaccination space um, we will also uh, publish a, a, a toolkit, a new publication that will be more a hands-on publication for practitioners in 2021 after the series of uh, events that we are uh, organizing uh, with GSK vaccines this year that will end in January 2021. We will also work on vaccine hesitancy, as, uh, as I mentioned before, and we hope to put a lot of emphasis on that because that's definitely uh, an, an important role that pharmacists can play in addition to delivering the vaccine itself. So there's, uh, we will definitely continue to, to work in this area and to uh, promote this important role by pharmacists. And as Catherine already mentioned, now that we have the, the FIP development goals and several of them will have a direct and overt link to vaccination services, we will develop also the indicators and the mechanisms 
uh, and the roadmaps and, and, and all the, um, the transformation programs to further assist our member organizations in implementing uh, vaccination services at country level, in achieving vaccination authority for pharmacists, uh, and to, or even to expand the role of pharmacists in vaccination to other age groups, to other vaccines, for example. So definitely we have a, a lot of work still to do and we will continue to, to, to prioritize this area. Thank you, Gonzalo. And then the next question, I've got the last question for Leonora or Brian. So what are some of the best examples of pharmacist vaccination services provision that have enhanced patient safety? Leonora, can you hear me? Okay, I might pass. Hi. Oh, yes, here we go. Thank you. So, I I believe that all the the vaccination services internationally that that the pharmacists were are involved in are have enhanced patient safety. So it it is hard um, to identify. You know, there's pockets of excellence everywhere, and as Gonzalo took took us through. Um, in, in the earlier slides, the different countries, you know, in Canada, for example, flu vaccination rates have risen dramatically as a consequence of their um, increased service accessibility. And, and it's so convenient uh, for community pharmacies. You know, sometimes in, in countries, it can be a week or two before you get an appointment with a, with a, a doctor. So, um, and in Canada, the administration of vaccinations is it's authorized across the full 10 provinces. And also, you know, organisations such as the, the Canadian Pharmacists Association, um, it's one of their top three advocacy priorities. And, and in Portugal, uh, over 40% of the flu vaccinations are, are now administered through pharmacy. Um, in, in the US, 10 years after the implementation of the flu vaccination through pharmacy, you know, vaccination rates are, are more, have more than doubled in, in, in young adults. And... Um, so I, I believe the statistics are standing for themselves. I think we need to do, so we have some work to do in, in um, making, in the public awareness um, on the fact that vaccines are there and available through their, their local pharmacies. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for the, the, the COVID vaccine and when, if and when that is released, pharmacy is, is in an absolutely perfect position to to be um, to lead on on the vaccination program uh, globally and and of course you know if there's side effects pharmacists are are there and can capture all of those and, and feed that back um, to manufacturers so that's a hugely important uh, thing to be able to do through their pharmacovigilance activities um, and you know through uh, through their um, education and uh, public awareness campaigns I think pharmacists are doing an excellent job. I, I couldn't identify one uh, one uh, patient safety um, excellent service over another. I think they're just doing an amazing job globally. Thank you, Leonora. And then I've got the last question for Farah. Um, as a young pharmacist, what is your vision for the potential of pharmacist vaccination in the future, regionally and globally? Thank you, Carleen. Uh, I think that it's essential that the borders of pharmacy profession continue to develop as a dynamic process. I think it's about time to move beyond our conventional role and actually begin to engage as primary health practitioners uh, as we continue to plan our future profession. My vision revolves around expanding the ability of pharmacists to safely and effectively administer vaccines and manage adverse reactions points and to furtherly contribute in delivering public health services beyond that of our selected vaccinations only. For example, non-communicable diseases, chronic conditions, those, those that are more susceptible to infections and other injectable medications, for example, such as antipsychotics, vitamin B12, and et cetera. Uh, I hope to see pharmacists seeking leadership roles in immunization, such as screening, for example, identifying vaccine needs for certain patients and developing programs, providing vaccine consultations and patient counseling. So I would like to sum up by quoting my dear colleague, Shirley Marlaniti, who's the president of the Young Pharmacist Group. She once said to me that um, we will only transform our profession by actually transforming the vaccination. Thank you. Thank you, Pat.
So now I'd like to pass back to Lena to see if there's any more questions from the audience that you'd like to share. Thanks, uh, Carlene. There are lots of questions, but I'm afraid we do have to move on, but we are going to answer every single one through the chat and Q&A. And also we will make sure we will be answering them specifically through the event coming up. So thank you so much for all of these questions. Please keep them coming um, and we will, we will log them, record them and use them for, for our events and to help us refine some topics. So actually, I think we'll pass on with the, with the final um, part of the presentation. And I think I'm passing on to Gonzo uh, for the next bit of the slides. I think, Catherine, would you like to present the, the, the call to action? I would indeed, Gonzo. So um, Gonzo mentioned last week that we had an event on can the world afford low vaccination coverage? And at that event, there was a call for us to develop a call to action. So we are using today, World Pharmacist Day, to launch this call to action to expand the role of community pharmacies in vaccination, including against COVID-19. And I know that was in the Q's and A's and the chat boxes. So Lena's point is really well made, colleagues. We will pick up all of these and weave them into the subsequent sessions. Do not fear. We have complete sign off from our bureau and I thank every single one of them for their uh, commitment to this. Next slide, please. So I won't take us, I won't take too long, but I wanted to tell everybody about where this has come from. We all know, we've spoken about this today. Uh, Leonora has backed this up. Gonzo has given all of this, us the evidence. It's, it's a given. Vaccination is one of the most successful and cost-effective health interventions of all time, second only to clear, clean water. Um, now more than ever in 2020, we know that community pharmacies are the first point of contact within the health system. We've seen that second to none. And today we commend all our pharmacists for being um, having open doors to patients and the public. Not only are our pharmacies staffed with highly skilled people, but they're also trusted, convenient health facilities embedded at the heart of all of our communities with appropriate infrastructure and logistics. And Leonora has just spoken about that. We are safe. We are safe to act, we're safe to vaccinate. Um, and we have the right uh, systems in place to ensure adequate storage and distribution of medicines, including those that require strict cold chain management. We offer essential public services and can be a key partner in primary health care through disease uh, prevention strategies. Next slide, please. In addition, we know that community pharmacies and the staff within are often involved in vaccination promotion and delivery. Data from this year in at least 86 countries showed that pharmacies play a variety of roles in vaccination advocacy, awareness and advice. And in at least 36 of those countries, they play an active role in administering vaccinations legally and under registration. And whilst this has been proposed or is undergoing development, a further 16 countries are coming on board. And Gonzo, you were super in listing the countries that you know about and also the countries that are coming on board. One of the key levers for this is um, to ensure that we promote life course vaccination across the people's life course to increase convenience of access. And it's not difficult to see that pharmacies can play a big role in this. And then 2020. It provides us with a different focus and a different context. And in the face of our current pandemic and to prepare for future pandemics and future waves of this pandemic, it's imperative for all our countries to really expand their vaccination pathways so that we achieve high vaccination coverage. We need to also consider collective immunity as a strategy. And out of equity, our goal number 10, in access to disease prevention measures and to ensure highest possible level of quality of life, and functioning at all stages of that life to gain the full health and economic benefits from vaccination. We would say it's an ethical and public health imperative to expand these schedules and strategies beyond infancy across all ages and through the diversification of vaccination pathways, especially for adults. A healthy population is essential for the growth of our economies. We can all see that in all of our countries as we struggle to find the balance in the COVID pandemic. Vaccination should form the foundations of our public health programmes if we are to reach our full potential. 
we know that the economic benefits of vaccinations against 10 diseases in 73 low and middle income countries between 2011 and 2020 through an increase in productivity is estimated at 251.4 billion US dollars. Vaccination improves productivity, increases healthy life expectancy and reduces long term disability. In addition, it helps to improve access to education by ensuring children are not prevented from accessing education due to ill health or disability and through a reduction in school days lost to self-limiting illness. Also, vaccines deliver immense value by curbing antimicrobial resistance by reducing the circulation of sensitive and resistance pathogens. And we know this through our antimicrobial commission. This will form part of our strategy there. We know that the WHO makes the case for access to vaccinations to be considered a basic human right by all our countries, such as the importance in the prevention of disease and ill health, and that is never more true than now. The benefits spread far, far further than keeping a vaccinated individual healthy. The impact of a successful vaccination program can and does improve the health of the whole population through both indirect and direct impacts. Vaccination can help reduce healthcare costs, allow health budgets to be spent in other areas and promote economic success of countries. In summary, vaccination is one of the cornerstones of any equitable and cost-effective health system across the globe. So the call to action. I will speed through this because um, our time is short, but this is so important, we cannot overlook it. Considering the above imperatives, the FIP, which represents over 150 national pharmacy organisations around the world, calls on governments and other stakeholders to one, recognise and fully harness the potential and convenience of community pharmacies for public health, primary health care and disease prevention strategies, including vaccination. Number two, to foster the full integration of community pharmacies in healthcare systems by creating the regulatory and operational conditions for interprofessional collaboration, including access to shared patient health records and vaccination records. And I know there was a question on that earlier as well. Number three, to expand the regulatory scope of practice and appropriately trained and certified pharmacists to authorize them to administer vaccines beyond infancy, including a broad range of vaccines. Number four, to promote the competence of pharmacists in vaccine administration through the development of the required knowledge and skills as an integral part of pharmacist foundational education and training and or through continuing professional development opportunities. Five, to invest in prevention strategies, including vaccines and vaccination services by all providers, including pharmacists, to ensure equity in access to vaccinations and the sustainability of the service. Number six, to ensure health system readiness for mass immunisation against COVID-19 and any future pandemics as soon as said vaccines are available. And number seven, to include pharmacists in emergency preparedness and response plans as frontline health workers. The measures I've just read are urgently needed to ensure equitable access to vaccines and vaccination services to all people around the world, across all ages, leaving no one behind, to reduce the burden of vaccine preventable diseases and so that pharmacists can play an even greater part in the fight against COVID-19 than you have been and other future pandemics. The link is below. So colleagues, FIP is not alone in calling for these, uh, these urgent measures and advocating for a bigger role for pharmacists in vaccination. And as you may know, an outline of this call was presented last week at the session I mentioned. Since then, not only some of our member organisations, but several important partners from outside this organisation and the profession have expressed their support in this call to action. Here we have a short message from our dear colleague and friend, Andy Shirtcliffe, who is a clinical chief advisor on quality use of medicines, pharmacy and allied health in the Ministry of Health of New Zealand. Kia ora Dr Duggan and to all of our FIP colleagues around the globe. First of all, thank you to the FIP for their hard work in supporting pharmacists the world over in so many ways, 
and particularly through 2020 with all of the challenges that COVID-19 has posed. We in Aotearoa New Zealand welcome the FIP's call to action to transform pharmacy practice, service and global health and have huge pleasure in being able to be the first to offer what support we can to this important initiative. New Zealand has produced an online vaccinator training to support rapid vaccinator workforce development in preparedness for a COVID-focused vaccination campaign. We are offering to share the full content of the training to countries who would struggle to support production of a resource for themselves. Other larger nations could utilise the content and pay a small royalty fee, which we would use to support further vaccination innovation. And alternatively, a high level summary could be provided so that a country could replicate the model without utilising the intellectual property if they so wished. It gives us great pleasure to be able to share this on the global stage if this can in some way promote the development of pharmacy practice, services and further that laudable aim of improved health by access to vaccination for all. Thank you again, Dr Duggan, and to all of our FIP colleagues for this wonderful opportunity and the leadership that you show on the world health stage. Nā mihi nui, thank you, and go well. In, in the words of our president, Dominique Jordan, that is truly solidarity and action. We thank Andy so much. Thank you, Andy, very, very much. Then uh, we we come to our close partners and friends at the International Federation on Aging, an organisation representing over 75 million older adults around the globe and who are also in official relations with the WHO. They have supported this call to action. We thank Dr Jane Barrett for strongly supporting community pharmacists in increasing access and convenience of vaccination services to people of all ages and the IFI AFA has just released a fantastic report with an analysis of the messages and format, formats of influenza vaccine ca campaigns um, that we applaud and we support and we would be showcasing. So I urge you all to have a little look at that. This is a real example of partnership in, in practice. We also want to mention and thank our partners and friends at the International Longevity Centre. They have been advocating for a broader role for pharmacies and pharmacists in disease prevention strategies across life course. They've expressed a support for our call to action as well. Thanks to David Sinclair, Director of the ILC UK, and their entire team, for such a close collaboration. You know, colleagues, in this time of COVID, you can't do it on your own, and this shows you the value of partnerships. Let, rem rem let me remind you of the next event in this series, Transforming Practice, a focus on strategy and policy for global change. It's on the 1st of October, and we will gather together the specific questions related to practice to be addressed more, more detail at that session. And now I think we are going to celebrate World Pharmacy Week and World Pharmacist Day. Thank you for that, Catherine. Uh, thank you for, for your uh, great insights, presentations and answers to all these big questions to you and Gonzalo. I'd like to also use this opportunity to thank um, Farah and Leonora and welcome Dominique, uh, FIP president, who's here to join us with messages of support for this program, but also messages of congratulations on this important day. Dominique, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. Dear colleagues and friends around the world, today I hope that across the globe you will all be celebrating our 10th World Pharmacies Day under the theme Transforming Global Health. Pharmacy is one of the key health professions that is helping to meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for a better future, including health for all. Pharmacists, are transforming the health of their communities through a variety of professional services, such as advising on healthy living, vaccinating to prevent disease, and ensuring that medicines are used optimally. Pharmaceutical scientists are transforming and prolonging lives 
by developing safe and effective medicines and vaccines and pharmacy educators are transforming healthcare by ensuring that there are enough qualified and competent pharmacists and scientists to meet the growing needs of our societies. Our profession has so much to be proud of. And today, of all days, let us join together as one pharmacy to make our societies, governments, and other stakeholders aware of our expertise and the enormous contribution our profession is making to the well-being of people everywhere. Happy World Pharmacies Day and long live pharmacy. Thank you for that, Dominique. And with this, we'd like to thank you once again and remind you um, that we will hopefully be meeting next year in Seville in 2021. And we'll put on the next slide um, just to remind everyone of that. I think, Dominique, thank you so much for your messages of support. I'd like to maybe... May I, may yes, I say something else? Please. I just want to thank today, before I close the meeting, on behalf of all the pharmacists present uh, over the world, and on my behalf, to thank my bureau colleagues, but the complete, staff, the complete staff of FIP, under the lead of our CEO, Catherine Duggan, for the work done to allow us, despite the pandemic, to have this successful virtual Congress of this, and this uh, fabulous week. It was a hard work, but it was worth it. I also want to thank all the speakers, panelists, and volunteers who contributed largely to these successful weeks. I will also thank the sponsors. Without their help, it will not be able for us to organize that. And of course, a big thank you to all of you who attended our session during these three weeks. You are the soul of our federation. You are FIP and I am proud to be your president. Without your support and your commitment, FIP will not be able to move the profession forward for the benefit of the population in every regions of the world. Let's keep our collaboration and move to the next steps with trust, solidarity, and action. Long live to pharmacy. Long live FIP. Thank you very much. And thank you for your work. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now, but we're sure to see you again. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank, you. thank you. Bye. Bye. Happy World Pharmacist Day. Happy World Pharmacist Day. Thank you, Dominique. Welcome, Catherine. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> <laughs> Universal kiss noise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>